Hello, welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4, Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 6, Supply Relationships, and it's Learning Outcome 3, which is to understand the concept of partnering. We will look at the concept of partnering and where it is a suitable approach, the process of partnership implementation, and the reasons why partnerships fail. So there are three types of partnerships. Type one partnerships is where the organisation recognise each other as partners and they coordinate activities to plan on a limited basis. The partnership has a short term focus and involves only one function within each organisation. These types of partnerships are less time intensive to develop. So, for example, a buyer and supplier set up a partnership to improve an aspect of their relationship, such as delivery over the next year. Procurement is involved from the buyer's side and operations from the supplier's side. Type two partnerships. This is where both partnerships, sorry, both companies progress beyond coordination of activities into something known as integration. So the partnership has long-term focus and a number of functions within both companies are involved. The scope of the partnership now spans several years. So an example would be a buyer and supplier desire to invest in the same ordering and delivery system to improve their integration. From a buyer's side, procurement, ops and the stores are involved. From a supplier's side, sales and operations are involved and a cross-functional team is developed to manage the process. And then type three partnerships is where the companies share a significant level of operational integration. The buyer and supplier view each other as an extension of their own firm. There's no end date set for this partnership. So for example, a buyer and supplier have additional integrated systems and have developed just in time delivery. This helps with delivery and stock holding. Therefore, the supplier is viewed and treated as a key partner and is involved in product development. So partnership versus traditional contracting. We can clearly see from the relationship spectrum that there is a difference in the level of duration, trust, communication and problem solving between traditional relationships and partnerships. On one hand, at the left, you, you've got the sort of competitive tactical um, end of the spectrum, which is short duration, low trust, very close to communication and problem solving is sort your own problems out, don't worry about anyone else's. And when you move to the other end where the partnerships are, this is far more collaborative and strategic for a long term duration. You need high levels of trust and communication that needs to be open to allow you to do the joint problem solving. Now the partnership model was developed by Lambert. What this does is it illustrates the drivers and facilitators of partnership relationships. It can be used by buyers and suppliers to determine whether entering a partnership would be appropriate and beneficial. It also uses the access Sorry, it's also used to assess existing relationships to see whether they need to be changed or developed or whether they're performing as well as they could be. So perhaps carry out some research, think about some of the advantages of partner partnership sourcing and some of the disadvantages. So, for example, joint disadvantages of partnership sourcing is where both parties are at risk if the other party fails or if they risk leaking confidential information. A disadvantage for the buyer could be supply complacency and price creep. And a disadvantage for the supplier is that supply can be over dependent on the buyer's business at the expense of develop developing businesses with other customers. You might also want to do some research on backward, forward and vertical integration. 
backward integration is when a company expands its role to fulfill the tasks that were formerly competed by businesses up the supply chain. So essentially buying or merging with another company that supplies you with the products or services you use. Forward integration occurs when a company decides to take control of the post-production process. So you, if you're a car manufacturer, for example, you may decide you want to acquire the dealership that sells the cars on the forecourts. So therefore you're controlling the forward part of the supply chain. So backward integration is about the, the supply chain behind you, forward integration is about the supply chain in front of you. And then there's this vertical integration, sometimes known as horizontal. And this is where you choose to, I guess, increase your size, either by acquiring a competitor um, or diversifying your products and services. Now, both the buyer and supplier must believe they will receive significant benefits. So that wouldn't be possible without the partnership. So these drivers for partnership include generating synergies that are likely to result in reduced costs and increased profitability. The ability to develop products more quickly, which is particularly important as product life cycles shorten because new and enhanced products are being brought to market more quickly. It enables both parties to survive in the face of changing or unstable markets. Reducing stock holding and moving forwards just in time or lean production. Improving performance to satisfy the ultimate customer in the supply chain. And working together to identify wastes such as unnecessary or duplicated activity. Bottlenecks and delays, errors, rejects, and unnecessary inventory. Enabling access to a particular market, it could be, for example, foreign or restricted marketplaces, which might require a buyer to partner with a local supplier. A need for buyers to source highly complex products or services, or to increase the security of supply where supplies are scarce. So the advantages of partnerships need to be sustainable for both the buyer and supplier over the long term. And there are joint advantages as well as advantages that are more related to the buyer or the supplier. Now the Crowdrip matrix is used to categorize items based on financial risk and supply risk. They represent um, the different types of categories that you will be procuring. Now strategic products on the top right hand corner have the, the biggest financial impact and the highest supply risk. So for these the buyer would benefit from developing a partnership style relationship with a supplier which could lead to synergies that result in cost savings. If spend is high even saving one or two percent could have a very large impact on the profitability of the company. So those that are most appropriate for partnership will be high spend, so focus on your 80-20 strategic suppliers, and high risk, focus on those with the highest risk. That could be technically complicated suppliers, those that are not off the shelf solution, but are specifically developed for you as the buyer. Or new services, because new product development can be really costly. It's high risk and it's resource intensive. Fast changing technology. Buyers may need to act quickly to develop in a partnership relationship. And restricted markets. If supplier is operating in a restricted market with few competent and reliable suppliers. Now, as noted by Partnership Sourcing Limited, there are three key elements to selling the philosophy of partnership sourcing. The first is to sell the idea to senior management, then to the functional areas, and then to the potential partner. 
So when you're selling the idea to the senior managers, you need to develop a formal business case that outlines the benefits and values of the partnership sourcing strategy. Detail all the potential options for working with the supplier market, such as developing a partnership, running a competitive tender for a single supplier, and contracting with multiple suppliers. And include all the advantages and disadvantages for each of those options. Then you sell the idea to the functional areas. And there you need to identify the stakeholders that have high interest in the partnership philosophy and a high level of power to champion the partnership to the rest of the business. Identify the stakeholders who may oppose or resist it and move towards developing a partnership relationship. You need to work to convert them to be the supporters before you can mobilise against the partnership. And then communicate the benefits of entering the partnership to the stakeholders group. The Cotter eight step change management model can be used to sell the philosophy to the rest of the business. And you can see that on the screen. So firstly, create a sense of urgency and build a guiding coalition. Form strategic visions and initiatives enlisting volunteer army. Enabling action to remove any barriers. Generate short term wins because that will help with that sense of urgency and then sustain the acceleration. And the final step is to institute the change. Then the third step would be to sell this idea to the potential partner. Determine who the key stakeholder is in the supplier's business and undertake some stakeholder mapping. Now you can present the idea to a key stakeholder who is a senior member of the supplier's organisation. They need to have a high level of power and interest in order to sell the philosophy to the rest of their business. And then clearly detail the business benefits for the supplier of entering into the partnership. You then need to define the standards that potential partners will be expected to meet. So firstly, a commitment to total quality management and clearly defined quality management, which covers the efforts of all departments within an organisation to improve processes, products and services. Secondly, the ability to apply a just-in-time method, which can be developed with highly collaborative relationships like partnerships and requires integration of buyer and supplier systems. The third is the ability to provide supplies locally and or globally, and that will only be relevant to a buyer working for multinational companies, which operate internationally with offices in several countries. The fourth is the willingness to take part in innovation programmes, whether it be products or services itself or the production and delivery process. Number five, flexibility management. That's the ability for a supplier to react flexibly to changes required by the buyer. And finally, behaviours. Open and honest communication helps to build trust as well as fair, non-optimistic behaviour. For a partnership to be successful, the buyer will have to establish joint commitment from the buying organisation and the supplier. Lack of commitment is the key reason why partnerships fail. There are a number of ways that joint commitment can be established in order to ensure that the partnership gets off to a good start. So communication is first. You need to establish a formal review structure, including team, review frequency, methods of communication and escalation points, as well as timescales, forecast and information. You then need contractual commitment and partnership governance, which is outlined in a formal partnership agreement, similar to a signed contract by both parties. Then driving commitment and allocation of resources from top down, so it needs to be driven by senior management. You then have joint objective settings and those objectives need to be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound joint planning and decision making, 
Benefits and resource allocation include an incentivized to be met to meeting the objectives and then have some quick win to demonstrate the benefits for both parties. Now it's important that regular reviews of the partnership are undertaken as it develops through implementation stages through to business as usual. Now reviews are required to ensure that the efforts that have been put into developing the relationship by both the buyer and supplier is resulting in tangible benefits and improvements for both parties. And reviewing the partnership is really important for a number of reasons. Firstly, what gets measured gets done. Benefits and added value objectives will be achieved. You're able to document and celebrate the successes. And then that will provide you of an opportunity to review what is working and what's not working. You can assess the current levels of support and identify any areas for further improvements and development. The steering committee supports development of trust and it can be used as decision points. Now the project audit will assess the extent to which the project has complied with the governance that's set out by the steering committee and has met its aims and objectives. There are several benefits of undertaking an audit of the partnership relationship. So it can look at how partnership is progressing against milestones. Again, what's gone well, what could be improved, uncover any problems that can be addressed before they derail the partnership. Review whether the project is complying with the governance and it serves to install confidence in management and shareholders. Now partnerships can fail for a variety of reasons. This is really quite difficult to see. So I'll speak through it if I can. The first is from the external environment, that's at the top. And that's made up of a number of factors that could affect the partnership. It can create opportunities and threats for both the buyer and supplier. So therefore they should continue to monitor their external environment to identify any threats and opportunities. Once a partnership and buyer have, um, the buyer and supplier should conduct this analysis jointly and regularly. Macro external elements are known as the steeple factors. So for example, the economy enters a recession or new technology enters the marketplace. And then micro factors such as Porter's five forces. But do note that the partnership itself may have an effect on the marketplace and could change as a result of performance especially if it's a performance problem or a change in key personnel. Now, partnership between buyers and suppliers often fail due to a combination of issues. It could be management, communication, culture, or misaligned goals. And poor communication is ranked the highest reason for partnerships failing. But people communicate for the following reasons to exchange information, to build relationships, to persuade and to confirm understanding. So when you're looking at exchanging information, at the very start of a partnership, the relationship between the buyer and supplier needs to exchange information so they can decide on whether the proposed partners are suitable. And building the relationship, it should start off as operational and strategic level. So I suppose here what you're looking at is developing rapport and trust, and building respect. In the persuade stage, you need to communicate to persuade each other on the merits of the ideas that come forward. And finally, to confirm understanding ensuring that you both have the same understanding, which will reduce conflict. And the communication cycle is a two-way process. The receiver sends out a message, which needs to, I suppose, some communication that the message has been received. 
and poor communication between the buyer and supplier could be due to a presence of common communication barriers so distortion or omission of information by either party or both which reduces the transparency between the companies and that could have an impact on trust it could be a misunderstanding due to lack of clarity or technical jargon lack of communication skills or use of an effective method of communication or it could be communication overload when too much information is provided so that the important aspects of the message are lost effective communication limits the content of the communication to the important points so there should be a communication link across all levels of the organizations that includes strategic tactical operational interpersonal and cultural links if one of these links is missing then vital information may not be shared or transparency could be affected. Poor communication can cause a multitude of issues which can feed into reasons that a partnership fails. It could be lack of understanding of their roles, errors and inefficiencies, lack of transparency and openness or poor buy-in to the partnership, conflicts and reduced ability to, to um, improve. And then we've got lack of senior management support and trust. Senior managers will intentionally sideline high performing partnerships or limit communications and social bonding among the team or compile ill matched teams if they think it will help ensure their own place at the top. But senior managers who are driven by the desire for power are more likely to undermine a group communication and cohesion than those who are motivated by desire or respect. Partnerships may fail due to international sabotage or by lack of engagement with senior managers who are motivated by respect. And based on stakeholder mapping, senior management cannot merely be informed or consulted, but must become partners in the supporting initiative. If there's no trust, people become defensive. If there's an element of trust, they become respectful. The Seven Habits of Highly Efficient People by Stephen Covey introduce, introduces habits six as synergy, the principle of creating cooperativeness. And synergy is defined as the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that means that the relationship which the parts have to each other is a part in itself. It's not only a part, but the more cathartic, the most empowering, the most unifying and the most exciting part. By the whole being greater than the sum, it indicates that one plus one equals three or more. So synergy is key. It's everywhere in nature. The essence of synergy is to value difference, to respect them, to build on strengths and to compensate for weaknesses. Now poor planning precedes poor performance and there's a number of key steps that can be undertaken to avoid poor performance. Sorry. You can do product and supplier analysis cross-functional team development, jointly setting your goals and objectives, developing a business case, mapping your stakeholders and undertaking due diligence, developing non-disclosure agreements, undertake goal and action planning, identifying resources and developing a communications plan, assess your IT integration and plan your operations. The expected level of value added benefits from a partnership may not materialize because of a number of reasons. So value added benefits are enhancements that a supplier makes to a product or service before they sell it to the buyer. These could include features at no extra cost, an extended warranty period, 
or services such as training. And the reasons why these added value benefits don't materialise is that sometimes the buyer selects the wrong supplier or the partners become complacent. It could be because the market has changed or the relationship isn't managed or purely due to unrealistic expectations. And these changes in the market, I suppose the external market can have a big impact on a buyer and supplier and this can be positive or negative, creating either opportunities or threats. And changes in the marketplaces are often caused by changes in customer behaviour. And in today's modern world, technology and globalisation means that markets are changing faster than ever before. So Porter's Forces is a good model to look at to see if there have been any changes in the market. Now, partnerships are also more likely to fail if business culture of the buyer and supplier are incompatible. For a partnership to be successful, a buyer should partner with a supplier with compatible values and cultures. And here we can see examples of cultures that would not work too well together, such as aggressive versus laid back. So a power culture is really autocratic. It's controlled by one individual. A role culture is autocratic or pattern, paternalistic, which is well defined with authority. A task culture, again, is paternalistic or democratic, which is a matrix org with cross-functional teams. And a person culture is very democratic, individual experts with a very flat structure. And then finally, logistics and distance barriers. So before entering into a partnership, the buyer needs to research the logistics process to assess whether it's viable and cost effective. Transporting goods from other countries will not only include the cost of transport, but also the duties and taxes. Then you need to consider the distance barriers, such as the time differences, physical distance and language barriers. That's the end of Learning Outcome 3. Thanks for watching.